Okay, good morning to everyone, and thank you so much to Dr. Michael Lockun, which is not here, but he, he is the one that invited me, and thank you to Dr. Malati for the introduction, and especially for you, come here Saturday morning to, to see this lecture about medical marijuana and other supplements. I have to say that we, physicians, have been overlooking this uh, topic uh, for a long time. We have been uh, sometimes, you know, criticized uh, our patients for taking uh, these supplements, herbs, teas, or other uh, alternative therapies on Parkinson's. So I was, you know, wondering if is they really, are they really for real or not? So that, that's the question. Do we have some scientific, scientific information on this? And yes, actually, we have some, and probably they are beneficial, but we are very behind. And I think that it's time to explore, to make this question a little bit more, you know, punctual to ourselves as physicians, but, but also give you guys the information that you need of where you're taking. First of all, I realize that there is a lot of patients taking supplements vitamins, what we call now nutraceuticals, and other drugs for Parkinson's. So let's, let, let's do it. Sorry for the logistic problem. So first of all, as you will know, Parkinson's disease is a condition in where dopaminergic neurons and other neurons are having troubles to manage some of the physiological uh, situations. Dopaminergic neurons are localized in the substantia nigra, and, it, and it's called like that in the middle of the brain because it's black. And lost the tincture while the, 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 the degenerative process comes on. Several processes are involved in this, from energy dysfunction to metal accumulation to the accumulation of waste products. So. So far, we don't have any drug or any therapy that could avoid this situation to happen. When the motor symptoms began, the disease already initiated years before. And we know that because patients used to have a lot of things before. For example, sleep disturbances, smell problems, constipation, and by the time that motor symptoms, and motor symptoms are referred to slowness, rigidity, tremor, or postural imbalance, when this happened, these things happen, the uh, neurological degenerative process have a lot of time coming on. And we know that medications for the motor symptoms you will take in now as levodopa, dopamine agonist, just try to restore or supply the dopamine deficiency that is happening. We know that when the disease is uh, progressing, uh, the duration of the efficacy and the efficacy of this medication start to run out. And we need to use other medication trying to stop this uh, uh, very uh, you know, uh, problematic situation. So this graphic, uh, it's about that, how life goes on. I don't want to use those numbers to say that's going to happen to all patients, but just it's graphically explaining what is happening in life through Parkinson's and what is happening with the medication response. So it's a very tiny you know, <laughs> screen there, but it, it's about that. And of course, when time goes by, other situation comes, like the shortening of the duration of the medicine. And uh, we only try to fill the holes in the boat. We only try to use medicines to restore quality of life, but we can't stop it now. So uh, at this time, we had a lot of drugs that could help us. And it seems like, you know, a, a complete arsenal of drugs there but for, for reality, it's a small. And not only for motor symptoms as the first slide, but for non-motor symptoms too. Uh, since years ago, 
uh, before Levodopa, probably thousand years, there is several remedies as tinctures, herbs, teas, and even marijuana that have been used for the treatment of Parkinson's. We know that a lot of these historical drugs have anticholinergic properties. Do you know anticholinergic like cogentin, for example, that could stop some of the tremor but have some cognitive issues and it's not, you know, we, uh, use it anymore, at least here in the United States and other countries still have some, uh, some, something to do. So well, we know that this uh, kind of alternative medication in the past still have a place in the treatment and still have a place in the minds of our societies. So for the treatment of Parkinson's, uh, we used to uh, treat in several ways, trying to avoid risk factors, try to, in the very beginning of the disease, to restore to protect or rehabilitate dopamine neurons. We try to use medication just for fill it out uh, uh, the, the need of the dopamine. We use exercise. We even use surgery now, DBS. This is, uh, this is a place very important for surgery elsewhere. And we are trying to do something else with gene therapy, for example, with cell transplants. But also, alternative treatments have a place. And from those, we're going to speak about specifically nutrition supplements. This is a table that shows all the complementary and alternative medication and uh, medicine in general that have been used for that, from aromatherapy, from music therapy. I know that you have a session after this, from energy healing, whatever. So, uh, but I'm, I'm going to focus on the nutritional supplements part. And let me tell you. Why? It's not only because it's frequently used, but also because some of them have potential interaction with our own drugs. So uh, that's one other question that I did have, actually. Oh, this is, it seems very, very tiny, but I'm going to explain. This table is showing several studies trying to figure out uh, how frequent uh, complementary and alternative medicines are used in Parkinson's patients. So there is, it shows studies from the UK, more than 50% of patients are using uh, one kind of alternative therapy, especially acupuncture with them. Argentina, we try to use some herbs. And in the United States, the most used more than 66% of patients use some kind of nutritional complements, multivitamins, sometimes herbs. And this, this uh, study didn't talk about marijuana, we'll see in the future. The information comes from this study made in Seattle, and it shows that patients with Parkinson's disease, the younger, and the high eye component is the ones that used to use more of these alternative medications. Some others uh, shows that not, it's not like that, that it, it will not depend on the age or uh, the stage of the disease or if they are using or not medication, you just use it, okay? So from nutritional complements, herbs, this is the, 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 the main ones that we, we are using. For example, there is a herb called the mucuna prudence. Have you heard about mucuna? No? Well, mucuna is an extract of, of the skin of the seed that contains levodopa. And that has been used for more than 2,000 years ago in India. It's part of the uh, Indian traditional Medica uh, medication. They tried to use uh, in a disease com called Campabata, probably the first description in Parkinson's. And then, let me stop here because we are s celebrating 200 years, or commemorating 200 years from the first publication of, of James Parkinson paper this year and now. So the Indians realized that this extract of the plant helped patients. Later on, until 1990s, we also realized that Mucuna has levodopa. Incredible. But well, herbs help in, in a way. You know? And some others, like this study in Colorado, 
shows that uh, cannabis also is used by patients with Parkinson's disease. And we'll see if cannabis or marijuana have a spot in the treatment of that. But first, well, you know, we use this. Are they for real? Are they working? Uh, for the compression, a better compression of the talk, I use this uh, table to refer on the quality of the studies that we have now on herbs, on medical marijuana, and on multivitamins to comprehend better how uh, the information, the scientific information is fed. So in blue, you will see some squares there indicating the level of evidence, a level of evidence C, B, or A, meaning that C, it has the less or, or the lesser quality information, and level A means that it has the best one, that use multi-center studies, for example. And the recommendation, they put it in green, yellow, orange, or red, means that it's, it had benefit if it's green, and if it had not benefit and it's not recommended, it, it is in red. So I try to do this, this color-coded thing. The other thing that you will see there is this kind of tables that are part of the of, uh, reviews or meta-analysis trying to compare different studies to see the evidence. Every time that you see a square that is to your left from the middle line of this graphic means that the risk is not there, that it's protective maybe. And every time you see a square going beyond the line, it will means that that uh, uh, study have risk or are not beneficial for that. Let's start with herbs. There is a lot of things to eat there. For example, curcumin. For example, uh, the almonds that could have some properties for as an antioxidant because they contain some vitamins, but also because they, they contain substances that could help dopamine neurons in that. This is a, a review or, or of all herbs that could help in Parkinson's. You see there uh, in little squares uh, how uh, they are having trying in Parkinson's disease models to see if they have some benefit to protect cells or to protect uh, animals from uh, an insult. In this case, for example, mice or rats are exposed to a, a chemical called MPTP, and it's a very useful model for Parkinson. And we see that a lot of, uh, of uh, herbs and a lot of leaves, seeds, roots could have some protect. You can recognize there the chrysanthemus, that is a horn kind of flower. You can recognize ginkgo biloba, which is very used. You can recognize it there to ginseng. So all these uh, plants have been used in, in animal models of Parkinson's disease, trying to find a way to protect the dopaminergic cells. But so far, we don't have any study with them in humans. So we can't say that or we can't recommend the utility of them in Parkinson's. By difference, there is other track that I already talked about, Mucuna prudence. This plant, its fruit contains some seeds and the skin contains levodopa. And as I told you before, it, it was used in a, a Indian traditional medicine called the Ayurdiva. And now we realize that uh, they have levodopa or that they couldn't have levodopa because of this study made in India. They tried to figure out how uh, useful could be using in patients. They, uh, they give the mucuna extract in pills uh, to 60 patients before uh, and after uh, uh, measuring the motor scale for Parkinson's and they realized it works. And actually, some of them got dyskinesias, which is a very good marker to see if a drug is working too. Other efforts try to figure out if it works. And this is a very small study using 18 patients. And they use another alternative treatment 
besides Mukuna. They try to clean sink first and then use the Mukuna extract to see if they have some kind of impact and they measure the response with a monitor scale that you you have to you have to know. This one they use it repeat test and so far how is the rigidity and the tremor and they show it works. Also, they had to measure the amount of lipodopa that each one of the uh, extracts have, and this study is showing that lipodopa is inside Mukuna. So we can say with, with a level B, very small studies, it's possible beneficial for the treatment of symptoms of Parkinson's. But we still, to have more studies to, rely, to realize if they've really it helped in the treatment. What we know is not only one mucuna, there is several kind of uh, plants having the same uh, or varieties here in America and also in uh, the Indian subcontinent. And different plants have different amounts of levodopa. And if you take out these plants uh, and you try to raise it in a different environment, the levodopa content will diminish. That's amazing because environment uh, have an impact on the, on the amount of levodopa as well. This is another thing. Yeah, I know that you know this. The vicia fava or the broad beans contains levodopa as well. And this is a study give, uh, given uh, broad beans, a plate of, with 200 milli, uh, grams of visio fava, and trying to measure before and after Parkinson's symptoms, and they saw, uh, they observed some benefits in six patients with Parkinson's. It's possible a way to treat symptoms too. This other one, Banibasteris capi, has the same element as one of the medicine that you're taking, resagiline or selagiline. This, this uh, is a uh, blocker of an enzyme that conserves uh, dopamine inside uh, the system, so it will help. So we have another way to treat it with this. What about teas? This is a study uh, in Japan trying to see if Chinese teas or Japanese teas could protect Parkinson's. They uh, figure out that patients in Asia are a little bit, uh, you know, have a little bit lower rate of Parkinson's than patients in the West. So they try to figure out if teas and dietary factors have an impact on that, and it seems that yes, but they cannot be, uh, take apart the fact that teas contains caffeine, and coffee and caffeine have anti-Parkinsonian effects, as we'll see in the next. Some other very complex herbal extracts using more than one, more than two, make more than four herbs in the same teas with impronounceable names could have an impact as well. For example, I squared there in red one study that shows that using this tea, this is a specific tea, helps patients that have a kind of Parkinsonism produced by uh, other drugs, what we call neuroleptics, and before using, uh, I mean, before the exposition to this medication, using the, the, the distract tea will help not to have Parkinsonian-like symptoms. What about the West? We also have something to say, especially in Mexico, I have to say, but well, maybe you, you, you will uh, hear about resveratrol. Have you heard about this? inside of wine, and has been been promoting as that. Well, there's no, there are no stories, uh, there is no studies in human so far, but we know that resveratrol could help dopamine cells in, in certain ways, actually just in, in, in studies in animal models. Okay, so this is uh, another meta-analysis. It means they try to compare several studies using uh, different kind of herbs, and they show that if they use, if, if patients use uh, levodopa plus one of these teas, they do better if they use, uh, compare using levodopa by itself. 
Well, they never compare the, use, the utility of a T versus levodopa, which is the, the gold standard of treatment, and would make us uh, you know, have an, a better information if they are helpful or not, but at least we know that. So with a level B, there is possible benefit in certain teas and herb extracts, but there is no a comparison from them to levodopa to tell exactly if they are helpful. What about medical marijuana? And I put there medical marijuana it could be not medical at all. Marijuana is not one thing. This is, one, this is one of the first things you have to say. Marijuana is more than 60 substances called cannabinoids. And it's very important to note know, know that because uh, some of them could have potentially beneficial effects, but some others could have a contradictory or even get worse your symptoms. Not only in cognition, which is the main concern of we doctors when they use it, but also in Parkinson's symptoms. So smoking marijuana could, you know, make, or eating marijuana could make you feel a little bit more relaxed, better, in a better mood, but not exactly helping symptoms for Parkinson's. And in, in the end, we, we just try to guide you guys to have a better deal quality of life. That's the thing that is important, not if uh, the scale improves or not. But we have to look all the picture, not just one spot there. So that's why it's, it's needed to, to understand what kind of things are we using. So in terms of marijuana, there is just a few studies. This was made here in the United, in the United States and tried to uh, see if an extract of marijuana could help on symptoms like motor symptoms, I mean rigidity, slowness, and dyskinesias, and it fails. And this is the best study that we have, only in 21 patients. This is a survey in Colorado. Colorado, of course, is where marijuana is legal now. And surprisingly, they have been not using so far uh, marijuana as I expected. Only 4% of 200 patients have used it, but they all report uh, some beneficial things in sleep, in mood, and in pain, which is not surprising. We know that marijuana has these kind of properties. In Brazil, they try a specific cannabinoid, the cannabidiol, that we know they have some dopamine agonist uh, uh, function, but they fail. They don't find any, any responding monitored scales from that. The patients feel better, but uh, in reality and objectively, they don't find any change in Parkinson's symptoms. And this is so far the uh, biggest study in, uh, in the literature now. This is one in Israel, smoking marijuana. They used only 21 patients before and after smoking marijuana. They tested for uh, uh, motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms, including pain and sleep disorders, and they find out that it works. And this is a positive study, one of the few positive ones. And they found that one patient, and I, I want to highlight that because it, I, I, as you've seen in the internet, there is a, a video, especially in Facebook, circulating uh, of a, a patient smoking marijuana and the motor symptoms that he has, specifically tremor and gay disturbances improve. They show from the 21 patients that one really have an on stage after smoking. That's good, but it's that, that's not all. And well, the American Academy of Neurology, three years ago, joined to settle down some guidelines on the marijuana uh, utility, and they found just two studies. I found more studies, some negative in, in red and some others positive in, in, in green. Uh, but only four with a good quality thing to do recommendation. And so far, as currently, 
with a level C, we can't recommend that. So there is no benefit showing literature in medicine on that. So it's an out. But we have still have to look at them for that. We have to still have more studies and see if it, this has some kind of utility in the future. I mean, this is a new weapon for our arsenal, maybe. But we have to wait until more studies come. What about vitamins, the, the so-called now nutraceuticals? A nutraceutical is a isolated product or purified product from a food that generally is sold in a, in a medicine form, a tablet, a cap, or, or, or any dose number related. Uh, not usually associated with it. That demonstrates to have a, some beneficial uh, in physiology. So this is the vitamins information. First of all, vitamin A, which you can find in those, all these products. So for vitamin A, we have some studies that says that the consumption of it, which has antioxidative properties, could help. But in this review, trying to figure out not only vitamin A, but also the carotens that it contains in, it seems that didn't work. So for now, with a level C, just a small studies, we can say that vitamin A is not beneficial for Parkinson's. Out. What about vitamin B? Vitamin B is a complex. It's not just one. It's one, two, and so far we have 12. And well, for now, what, we sh what this study shows is that vitamin B6 supplementation could be helpful, but not the other ones. Actually, patients treated with levodopa, it seems that it has some impact on B12 levels, and patients with Parkinson's used to have B12 levels a little bit lower than uh, people that without Parkinson's. So for now, there is no specific recommendation for, for other B vitamins, but probably a B, vitamin B6 should have an impact. Safe. What about vitamin C? Where it is just a small, this is a small study trying to figure out in 21 patients what kind of impact those uh, vitamins C could have. It was made by Dr. Stanley Fine that I know that joined you uh, uh, last year, and Dr. Fan in, in these 21 patients shows that the, the use, the utility of vitamin C could be on, uh, uh, on an improvement of the delay on. So it could make the uh, levodopa works a little bit more uh, rapidly. So vitamin C could be helpful in the absorption of levodopa. So, with a very small study, we can say it has possible benefits. Safe at home. What about vitamin E? So far, vitamin E is the most recognizable antioxidant. And we have a lot of studies there, but the main one is called Datatop. And this study was not made for uh, trying to notice if vitamin E is helpful or not but for another medicine that you will probably are taking, zelegiline or deprenil. And they show that patients taking vitamin E versus the one that take zelegiline are different, but patients taking vitamin E compared to those that take placebo are not different. It's mean that vitamin E couldn't have an impact on the disease. Probably is because the amount of vitamin E used in, in these studies was very low, less than 2,000 units, and probably we need more than 3,500 on them to see an impact. And there is, was no studies today that shows more uh, kind of, uh, of uh, these uh, doses. So with a level B of recommendation, we can say that there is no benefit from vitamin E. But so far, we need more studies in there. So it's an out two for the 
What about vitamin D? Vitamin D is very useful for uh, uh, decalcification and mineralization of bones. So it will protect you not only for Parkinson's, but other things. But it seems that a low level of uh, vitamin D is actually uh, uh, one of the features of uh, Parkinson's. And that that uh, produces a risk for Parkinson's that is twofold in comparison with people that are not having Parkinson's now. So there is several studies, and only one of them tried to supplement it with vitamin D, patients with Parkinson's, seeing that, yes, could work. So with a little bit of recommendation of these several studies, we can say that it's a possible benefit to take vitamin D for Parkinson's, so I think that we have to go on. And one of the, th the circumstances that, that uh, could happen and explain that is was that uh, uh, Parkinson's patients do not expose to sunlight, and sunlight is necessary for the production of vitamin D. So this study shows here in Miami that no, it all depends on the, on the amount of sun exposure and the amount of vitamin D that is related with that sun exposure. It's about uh, the metabolism of the vitamin that is affected in Parkinson's as well. What about caffeine, which I was taking? No, no, no. So caffeine has been looked at as a protective factor for Parkinson's. There is a lot of studies, the ones that I, you see there, like as HPFS, NHS, and HHS, are studies not made for Parkinson's, it's studies for, made for several risk factors. HPFS is a study in health professionals, or only males, male physicians. NHS is about nurses, and HHS is a Honolulu study in Hawaii. The data from those are very useful, and it seems that, yes, patients with Parkinson's used to consume letter, lesser coffee than, or lower, lower coffee than uh, patients, uh, subjects without it, and it happened in the three studies. It happens also in other countries, seeing the same observation, so it's intercultural and intercultural. And there is this small study made in Canada, actually in Toronto and Montreal, showing that with caffeine pills, measuring the symptoms of Parkinson's before and after, they observed that patients will benefit with caffeine pills too. So it has some anti-Parkinson properties. So caffeine, with a little b, seems to be beneficial for Parkinson's. How much? We don't know. <laughs> you have to take it every morning? Probably. And keeps you a little bit more awake or whatever. So, it's good. What about the consumption of the things? What about fatty acids? Have you heard about omega-3 and omega-6, fish oil specifically? They contain what we call the polyunsaturated fatty acids, and they, they seem to be protective. There's just one study that mentioned that it doesn't matter. The same happened with in calorie intake. It seems that fewer calories consumption a day will protect for Parkinson's. We don't know if it's now having Parkinson's if you have to take fewer calories. That is not correct. I mean, you need more to be energized enough and thrive. So with a level C, we have to wait for other studies in terms of this specific kind of fatty acid, the polyunsaturated containing in fish oil, for example. The other ones are not helpful. What about metals, minerals, magnesium, calcium, iron? Well, there is specific studies on that showing that iron is actually not beneficial but could be a risk factor for Parkinson's. There is no study, you know, taking iron in patients to see if they could be worse or not. But it has to be mentioned that Iron is a, 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 a product that we need in our body. And there is a, one theory in Parkinson actually that the accumulation of iron in dopaminergic neuron participate in its pathophysiology. So we are level C in these studies. I'm not going to uh, you know, put a particular interest in each one of them. It seems that they are not beneficial. And actually, the dietary content of iron is a little bit 
uh, higher in Parkinson's patients, and if it joined with magnesium, it sits at double the risk for Parkinson's. So we have to wait. This is only observations, you know, after. There is no studies using supplementation of iron or supplementation with magnesium to see how the patients is gonna, gonna be. What about CoQ10? CoQ10 is a mitochondrial enhancer. Mitochondria is like the battery of our cells. And CoQ10 uh, uh, makes that this mitochondria, these batteries of the cells, uh, get better in his work or, or work better. So CoQ10 has been explored in several neurodegenerative conditions, in animal models, and specifically for Parkinson, we have so far very good information. This is a review on it, uh, and the participation of, of uh, some of you could be, you know, be actually here because guys will uh, uh, participate in the, one of the main studies for the Q10 supplementation in Parkinson. And guess what? With a better level of evidence, it seems that CoQ10 didn't work. And out. This is the study. And the study includes more than 600 patients. And you see the lines overlap it because the difference from the, the ones that use the QQ10 from the ones that not is it's the same. So there is no benefit on the QQ10. Well, you know, studies are made in a, in a, in a temporal way just during some time. We don't know what could happen in the future, so I don't want that, you know, you guys think that everything that you might be taking or not could be wrong, no, but well, it's just the evidence. What about creatine? Creatine is used as a natural product in the body. It's an energy stabilizer as well as QQ10, and it, it, it works for uh, make the muscles go bigger, and it seems that the, the utility of creatine in Parkinson with a very low level of evidence, it's in the mindfulness. Could, uh, the patients are taking creatine, do a little bit better in mentation. So could have some benefit, and we have to wait for more studies there. So this is the end. I think that uh, we have a lot of information to give you on this, but we physicians we have to look at it over what we are taking and what we are, you know, uh, uh, what kind of interaction could be produced because of this. So we know that the, the Parkinson's disease treatment is complex and that medication that we use are limited. We know that the alternative treatment in Parkinson is a reality and it's a very frequent among American patients, Mexican patients, and everywhere. We know that herbal treatments as Mucuna may have benefit and we have to explore that and we need to do more studies to see it. We know that teas and herbal oriental therapies could help, but we need to compare them with the, the, with the drugs that we use now. We know that medical marijuana is not recommended based in the studies that we have in the, in the medical scientific, uh, scientific literature now and we need more studies to explore this new weapon. We need that vitamin D and B6 may have a benefit and we can recommend the you to use that. We now know that QQ10 don't have an impact in the progression of the disease and we can't recommend that now. And we, we see that, oh, sorry, well, we see that uh, creatine could have an impact as well. So this is my, my team in, in Mexico. I want to uh, first of all say thank you to Dr. Okun, to Dr. Malati, and to Dr. Daniel Ramirez, uh, one of my friends from over there, uh, and to you to attend to this lecture. I am open to questions when the time comes. This is the people that is working with me, Shelha Martinez, um, doctor, I want to acknowledge Dr. Fan, which was my mentor at Columbia University. The residents that are working with me, especially Nadia and Omar, who work so hard with me every day for my patients of C, and my partners in the ABC Hospital and in the National Institute of Neurology in Mexico City. 
Thank you so much. Thank you.